The Antifada is more than a podcast. It's a specter haunting the globe. It is the synthesis of the two most frightening things for the cheerleaders of this reactionary hallway. One ravaged by the unbounded savagery of capital and its states. Antifada super soldiers and Intifada. Bash the fash and the global uprising. Be prepared to enter. The Antifada Mindset. I'm Jamie Peck. I am Sean KB. I'm AP Andy. And we are broadcasting not live from Leftist Best Headquarters, about a half hour walk away from the gentrification ravaged Gowanus Canal in the coastal elite bubble of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. That's right. And uh, we have a special guest with us today. Hey, Justin, you want to introduce yourself? Hey, uh, my name is Justin Charles. I'm a member of uh, New York City DSA, Democratic Socialism of America. Yeah, um, Justin and I have done a few a few things together thus far in the North Brooklyn DSA. I look forward to doing more. The protest today was, uh, not today, the protest a few days ago was pretty good, I, w- I might say. We're Which, talking about the... The housing protest? Yes, that was great. I know, there's, we do so many. We do a lot of stuff. I was, um, I really liked it when Cuomo came out of the building and scurried to his waiting vehicle and everyone was like, Boo, shame. And right before that, they were going, Andrew, <laughs> Andrew. You want to give folks some context on uh, this protest? I could do that, sure. So um, our housing working group, um, in collaboration with some other community organizations, so like uh, New York City, uh, New York Communities for Change, uh, Mikasa Sukasa, uh, Make the Road, uh, Vocal uh, NYC, a uh, few others, some smaller tenant unions, tenant associations, tenant uh, rights organizations, all were out protesting Cuomo uh, and the housing crisis in New York City, which is his fault. Um, So there was a rally in front of the public library, and then we all took to the streets and marched up to uh, 63rd and Park, um, where Cuomo was receiving an award from some developers. Um, the name of the award, it's, it's just perfect. The name of the award is the Master Builder Award. Mm, Master Builder. Master Builder. Yes. What has he built? Nothing, but he's mm. helped developers build a lot yeah. of stuff. Well, and displaced well, a lot of people build. in the process. Well, I'll, Luxury I'll, apartments. I'll jump in. I mean, the uh, Master Builder Award, I think, uh, was actually started for Robert Moses, mm-hmm. who was a Master Builder. Um, yeah, I mean, Cuomo is obviously uh, in the pockets of uh, big developers, as any New York state or city politician would be. Um, He has actually, to his credit, uh, been able to leverage uh, some federal and state funds to do the Tappan Zee Bridge, the new bridge, uh, the Gothels Bridge, the uh, Bayonne Bridge, and also the uh, Kosciuszko Bridge, um, which has been great for all of us union construction workers. But the irony, of course, of uh, where you guys ended up uh, confronting Andrew Cuomo is that it was at the largest non-union contractors association uh, uh, office essentially, and mm. ironically, and not surprisingly, because I'm sure Cuomo likes his bread buttered on both sides. Jamie and I had actually seen Cuomo at a pro union count me in rally only a few weeks before, talking about how strongly he stands with the uh, building trades unions of New York City. So, unsurprisingly, a little hypocrisy from our fair governor. Yeah, we, we got good ideas on many sides, people. All he's, sides. Uh, he's like the interlo- interlocutor between the workers and the people who exploit the workers yeah he's just making deals making deals folks it's almost making like, deals uh, left and right it's almost like he's a politician who's like a bourgeois politician who mediates the relationship between classes but mm-hmm. that, that's neither here nor there before we go too much further i want to ask our guest a question that we ask all of our guests here at the antifada and that is how pure is your hate today oh it's very pure yeah, yeah. scale of one to ten what would you say let's give it better 8.5. Oof. 8.5. Your hate is so calm, though. It's, it's focused. <laughs> my, my, hate, my hatred is focused. So, Justin, your hate's at about an 8.5, which is uh, definitely what we're looking for on the Antifada. Anything below a 6, and we kind of show people the door. Um, so you made it. You made the cut. Similar to the um, premium episode we had last week, uh, I have a lot of hatred uh, built up right now. And, of course, as many hatreds are built in this city, it's uh, public transit hate uh, on my way over here. Now, we've been very, very, very generous towards uh, organized religion, uh, not 
shitting on, not being new atheists, not being fedoras, saying that religion needs to be abolished, that it's this oppressive institution. We've been very, very, yeah. very kind towards the conception of that. I would that all, so. That all fucking changed today. If you get on the B-38 at 12.15 on a fucking Sunday, guess what happens every time you pass a goddamn church? 15, people get on. 15 to 20 fucking churchgoers get on there. And not only that, but they have the unmitigated gall to sing fucking church hymns on the bus. <laughs> I'm trying to read Isaac Deutscher's biography of Trotsky. Not because I'm a Trotskyist, but because I like to learn stuff. And instead, I've got fucking, Jesus is our friend, we love God, blah, blah, blah. And it also took a fucking hour and 15 minutes for a 33-minute fucking bus ride. So that's it. Wow. It's all off. I'm a new atheist now. Wow. Fuck them all. They all get the fucking pike. Yeah. yeah. Anger, wow. anger. I'm like at 9.7 right now. I don't know Damn. what could set me off even more. Wow. Well, I'm a little cranky, I guess, because I woke up with a horrific stomachache. Um, it used to be that I would get hungover from like drinking and doing drugs all night. And now I, I ate half a slice of cheese pizza and it did approximately the same thing to me. So shout out to getting older. Oh, God. <laughs> we also saw Hereditary last night and that movie mm. fucked me up it was, uh, it was pretty friday night it was, oh you saw it too it was pretty good right it was very good but it also fucked me up yeah no spoilers no spoilers but, but i'm starting to think maybe that witches are bad you know what's bad That's a lot. i won't spoil anything but the movie was like it was scary but it was scary after all of this horrific family drama yeah you know family drama and the suspense around it might be even scarier than ghosts and witches i would agree yeah well I think, I mean, if I'd had the time to think in between being scared of this movie, I probably would have drawn some conclusions about, like, intergenerational trauma, um, mother issues, whatever. <laughs> but you know what? I'm going to leave it at that because people get very angry when you do spoilers if on you, a podcast. If, if you want the TR uh, too long, didn't read take on it, it's basically like Rosemary's Baby if the director was not a uh, child assaulter. <laughs> that we know of. That we know of. We'll do a little oppo and, and figure yeah, that out. You never but, know. Uh, yeah, and lots of suspense, uh, lots of family yeah. drama, and some uh, some ritualistic fun uh, thrown in there for good measure. Um, my friend Debbie is not going to like the message this movie sends about witches. Just got to say that. Well, she does have a witch store. Shout, so. shout out to Debbie. Might hit her bottom line. My friend with a witch store. Shout out to witches. She uh, she did the uh, logo for our podcast. Oh, she, she did do yeah. And so um, witches are good for something. And yeah, exactly. <laughs> They're a real mixed bag, those witches. <laughs> um, so let's see here. The most recent action that I... Were, were you there, Justin? Did I, I was, see you there? I was not there. Um, there's a pretty cute uh, labor campaign going on right now at the Kava Bar. <laughs> it's not often you can in... call labor struggles cute. But I agree <laughs> with you on this. At the Kava Bar in Bushwick. Uh, the one on Central Avenue. Not the one at the corner of Wilson and what, Soydum? Like yeah. a few blocks for our, away? For our international listeners, that's very important that you clarify. Yeah. There's a... Which kava bar? <laughs> <laughs> there's, we have a number of kava bars. What is kava? Kava is like uh, this herbal tea that chills you out. Oh, cool. And they also sell a kratom at this place. And uh, it's... We are pro-kratom on the Antifada. And there's, yeah, there's like a good weird community around it of like, Sober people and uh, people who are sober from benzos, people who are sober from opiates, people who are sober from alcohol and just want to hang out at a place that doesn't serve alcohol. And like a lot of hippies, a lot of weirdos. Like you'll often see like a guy with a bird on his shoulder mm. outside the one kava bar. I don't know if he goes to the other one. But anyway, <laughs> um, I guess this kava bar is abusing their workers and small businesses their, abusing their workers. Yeah, Get they're out of here. stealing wow, their tips and their wages. And they're harassing them, apparently. So they try to form a union. <gasps> and, uh, yeah, I'm not sure how many people actually work at that kava bar. But um, definitely, like, a small handful of folks. And uh, they actually fired the two people who organized it in response. So, unfortunately uh, for this small business owner, it is a DSA hangout for at least a few of us. Mm -hmm. So uh, this, uh, this organization sprang into action very quickly organized a consumer boycott of the kava bar as well as a picket line that was small but spirited and i saw, I, I was seeing all this go down on the dsa group dm the other day and they're like yeah we're trying to get as many people as possible to come out to this picket this first night and i was like well just 
just one thing to think about. You might want to wait because the dead are in town. <laughs> and I feel like that's really going to cut in to the number of Kava community members who show up to this thing. It's true. The Grateful Dead is, are basically strike breakers at uh, <laughs> Madison Square Garden or whatever the fuck they are. I mean, I knew their politics were suspect from the beginning, but Jesus Christ, a bunch of fucking scabs. Yeah. But um, do you want to call you out, Grateful Dead? <laughs> do you want to play the sound of the strike that I have? Uh, or yeah. the, of the picket? It's a really they cute. They came up with a cute little chant. So, want this tea? Is that what it is? Yeah, we want this tea. Union brood. Workers don't need to get screwed. Hell yeah. Yeah, that's good. And they did that for like an hour. It was awesome. That wasn't in like the Wobbly songbook, but I think that one will go down in history as Mm -hmm. the number one uh, tea related uh, labor chant. Yeah. In a hundred years, they'll still be talking about the uh, the great Kava struggle of uh, 2018. Yeah, I, I might say this is the biggest tea related action <laughs> since you know what. Yeah. It's, it's pretty massive. It's our tea party. And this one is in favor of workers' rights and not bourgeois democracy, right? I want to say it says something cool about this political uh, juncture here. Uh, I think with the rising of uh, unionism and labor struggles across the country that we're finally starting to see some momentum with, that uh, these hippie folks who work there i'm not i don't know them personally but uh you know maybe five ten years ago might not have thought to go out and uh you know call up some dsa folks and some union organizers and go out and actually form their own organization they probably would have just quit and said this job fucking sucks fuck you go work at one of the other 10 kava bars in bushwick exactly perhaps. but they, their their instinct was a great one which is even though they're just a handful of workers they just go out and organize throw up pickets it's great it's a- I want to give a shout out to the, to the folks that, that helped throw this together because it happened very quickly. Um, ben, our treasurer from North Brooklyn, he go, he he goes to this kava bar every day, Oof. and that's how we knew about it. Personal and, personal stake mm-hmm, here, so, mm-hmm. and, and he has relationships with 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 folks who who are who are customers there, and you know, yeah. Shout out to Ben. He uh, Ben is my hero. He really, I yeah, didn't know he had it in him. He was very fiery, uh, speaking at the picket line about what's going on at the kava bar mm-hmm. you could it? not get ben to go speak in front of a group of people you know a year ago so oh but now he's wilding out on the streets dsa kava bar. find your superpower that's right one other thing i would say too is uh, i think it does show the advantages of having a um uh, socialist uh, organization that's on the ground because you can jump into these struggles because it's not an outside force right people are involved in this uh kava related debauchery already so they they go and uh you know put their feet on the ground and uh jump in these uh struggles Mm -hmm. yeah we're making hippies political again oh my god can i tell a fucking hippie story (laughs) uh please Uh, please do this this is uh i can't believe that at this late fucking date that this like 1960s hate ashbury fucking bullshit um performative (laughs) cultural exercise and lifestyle is still going around yeah it's almost like the baby boomers still control everything right in our society (laughs) yeah and why are we like kowtowing to them culturally like it's like there's like it's like zombie boomerism you know like this boomerism will not fucking die well they got the cash I mean, how else are you going to get Bob Dylan on the cover of Rolling Stone every month? Well, these kids live in, they live in a completely different, obviously, historical period and, like, set of social conditions. And yet, and yet this culture continues like, like a zombie, like just a, all the worst parts of it and none of the political parts, really. It's, it's, a, it's a combination of the two scariest things, which is flesh-eating zombies and white dreadlocks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and you would know, right, Ben? Yeah, uh, I, 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 I'm in a good position in to addition know. To I was a huge hippie until... Fu- no, I'm just kidding. Mm-hmm. I never was a fuck. Fuck hippies. <laughs> I'm a punk. In addition to being a punks. history professor, uh, one of many jobs that Sean has had over the years is he used to work at a little festival called... Gathering of the Vibes in Bridgeport, Connecticut. So he knows this very intimately. Uh, you're familiar with this milieu. Yeah, a little too familiar. There were all these vibes all over the country, and somebody just decided to gather them in one place, uh, which, you know, had moved around over the years. I think it's a dead festival now. But, yeah, once a year I'd go and I'd work there, and I'd make a good amount of money to do, like, production work for events, which is another one of the many things I did. But going there and not only setting it up but spending you know a long 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 weekend uh working within this uh gathering of the vibes hippie neo hippie uh milieu if you will uh i got to see the inside of it and you know all the shit we were talking about with how you know it's it's uh like bankrupt in terms of like i don't know any sort of relevance to to today like tune in drop out you know get high or whatever it's like you know we haven't moved on in like 50 or 60 years but i think the most telling thing was that 
I believe it was the one I did in 2004 or five. But the Iraq war had not only started, but the insurgency had started in a big way. And it was becoming very, very clear that you know, we needed an anti-war movement, that people needed to mobilize themselves. I'm at this festival working it with, you know, fucking 20,000 quote-unquote hippies, right, who are aping this fucking culture from the 60s and 70s, which, you know, those hippies back then, sure, they were getting all fucked up and screwing everything and dressing all weird and dancing like idiots, but many of them, too, were protesting the war, and they had a real politics to their practice. The, I saw no fucking evidence whatsoever of any anti-war shit. No tabling, no fucking speaker from the stage saying anything, no fucking, uh, even, even people like uh, handing out flyers or leaflets against the Iraq war, which is killing all these thousands of people at the time. And I, it, it's just like, it's this- There were a whole lot of hula hoops, though. Oh my God. Well, if hula hoops could have ended the war, they would have been over that fucking weekend. <laughs> it's just this like apolitical lifestyleism now that again, it's just this like throwback. It denudes it. That's a good word. It denudes uh, what had been a semi-political thing of all of, the, all of its politics. It's just an excuse to like get into your mom's Volvo, you know, get a bunch of drugs, uh, camp for whip three it. days, do whippets. A little hacky sack. Ha- oh, definitely hacky sack. And uh, yeah, so fuck a whole bunch of that shit. The Kava struggle is cool. If hippies want to get down and get political again, that's awesome. Get yeah. fucked up on Kava and go on strike. And the Kava local is really going to grow uh, when Kava becomes like a national franchise. So I hope everyone is ready for that. Kava uh, workers of the world, you know. <laughs> I actually went... From your mouth to God's ears. <laughs> you've got nothing to lose but your unchill vibes. <laughs> I actually wrote uh, an article about Gathering of the Vibes one year, and I will put that in our blog somewhere because we're out of time to talk about it. But oh, yeah. just to give a couple of teasers, uh, Roseanne Barr was <laughs> running for president as a green that year. I met her that year, too. <laughs> How things have changed. Wow. And she lost the primary to Jill Stein, but she did give a rousing speech and pissed off wavy gravy. <laughs> she was anti-Semitic in the other way back then. <laughs> mm. In the right way. Mm-hmm. Just mm-hmm. kidding. That's, there's yeah. no right way. Wavy gravy did not like the speech and... Uh, I asked him to clarify. He's a globalist, right? Is that what? Is, is he? No. I don't know. He uh, he he said uh, I don't think there's anything similar about the Democrats and the Republicans. I asked him who he would support, and he said Barack Obama in a heartbeat. I want to go back and hear the bands, please. Like I pissed him off too by asking that question. Anyway, let us continue. It's time to talk a little bit about the news. The news. The goddamn news. If I was a real producer, I'd make a little news jingle or something. God damn it. We'll get there, man. It's only episode eleven. Yeah. We're, and we're actually 22 patrons away from Acid Kitchen, FYI. Oh, boy. Just throwing that out there. But mm. the news. Let's talk about the fucking news. What's in the news, Jamie, Justin, Andy, and me? Well, people have been talking quite a bit about this whole uh, Singapore summit with uh, Trump and Kim Jong-un. Uh, a lot of liberals are pretty angry about it. They went from being scared that Trump was going to start a war with North Korea to scared that Trump was going to... I don't know, like sign away America to them or something. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly what they think is going to happen. Juche, people. I talked to Kim. It's a great ideology. Like, uh, and yeah, obviously the North Korean regime, Kim, Kim's regime right now is very bad. Hey. I would not want to live there. Stop, 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 stop. Um, I uphold Juche thought on this show. Now you can cut that out. Let's go to the, um, uh, the Maddo sound. I think, uh, Jamie, you yeah, want to introduce Yeah, so... Um, Here's a little bit of sound from a Rachel Maddow that I think illustrates a lot of what's problematic about the uh, liberal line Russia, on this news. Russia, Russia, Go ahead, Andy. Russia has just this tiny little border, 11-mile-long border with North Korea, with one crossing on a train. And they've got a troubled and varied history over the decades with that country. But Russia is also increasingly straining at its borders right now and shoving back U.S. and Western influence, especially U.S. and Western military presence, anywhere near what it considers to be its own geopolitical interests. And one of the things that they have started to loudly insist on is that the U.S. drop those joint military exercises with South Korea. The U.S. has kept those going as a pillar of U.S. national security strategy for 70 years now. Until last night. No. When Trump casually announced that that's over now, he's doing away with those. Blindsided everybody involved and gave North Korea something they desperately want and would do almost anything for, except he gave it to him for free. Jesus fucking How come? Is her implication that Russia, like with the P-tape, 
is now like forcing Trump to back down on 70 years of really awesome, great military exercises? Well, no, there actually was a Wall Street Journal article. Someone sent it to the majority report saying that Putin did tell him to do that. Like it's on the record. Who gives a shit why he but, did it? Who but gives, yeah. I think the more important thing, A, when she says blindsiding everyone involved, does that include South Korea? Because <laughs> uh, according to a poll from Real Clear Politics, 81% of people in South Korea support the talks. It was actually the original idea of the president of South Korea who brokered this thing Moon and Jay put it together. Yeah. And uh, I feel like when it comes to something like this, we kind of got to listen to the people whose asses are most on the line. Listen. I don't. I support the 19% of people in South Korea who have nuclear weapons and uh, artillery pointed directly at them uh, in their capitals and will be blown up, you know, within, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 minutes of a war between North and South Korea. I support the 19% of South Koreans who reject the United States ratcheting down the pressures on North Korea leading to a potential nuclear holocaust. The fucking, like, I, I, ah, I'm angry. <laughs> I'm fucking I mean, mad. I, like, like the United States, its media and its people have no conception of how you look at the world from a different fucking perspective, right? It's not as it's not as if like the the, the people over there, you know, who who have lived with this, you know, for, for for decades, don't want peace. These people want peace in their on their peninsula, you know. Yeah, I mean, the criticisms of Trump are well taken. Like, obviously, he's not doing it for the right reasons. He probably just wants to put some fucking hotels uh, on the beachfront property in North Korea. But if that gets a ratcheting down of tensions on the Korean peninsula, that's fucking fine. And I'm not going to turn my nose up at that just because Trump did it. Right. And, and again, his motivations don't fucking matter. You've had ooh, 70 years. For those 70 years, there has not been peace. There's been an armistice between North and South Korea. Again, I'm not a supporter of Juche as much as it, there are some really good ideas in uh, North, <laughs> North Korean political thought. But um, fucking, yeah, it was a South Korean president, uh, Moon Jae-in, who around the Olympics started to broker this sort of uh, peace talk. And it's insane to me, although not surprising, that because liberals are fucking deranged by trump at this point in time and just more and more deranged in general as less and less americans like give a flying fuck about what they say or what they uh think that all of a sudden now rachel maddow and company are like the natsec party they're like <laughs> oh american you know uh, national interests in fucking in, in in east asia it's like dude fucking whatever it takes to like not engage in a nuclear war over there is a fine thing by me you know we sorry uh, go, go ahead well Two things. Um, people act like, I mean, she said that these war games are necessary for our national security, which is, it, it's just bullshit. Like, I don't think anybody outside of the U.S. believes that. Like, these war games, it's not just like we have some troops there for our own defense or defend of, defense right. of South Korea. <laughs> like, they're doing these war games with, like, fake nukes and stuff, like, literally on the border and in the ocean surrounding them. It's a little provocative. So I can, and like, I don't know. I mean, I'm not like a, you know, national security expert, but I'm not really sure how that's contributing to anyone's national security. And like, I don't, like if, if all that happens, if he's giving up these war games in return for nothing, like I'm fucking fine with that. Yeah. Like we shouldn't be doing that what, in the first place. What more do we want from North Korea? I mean, again, as not a defender of the regime and I am not a defender of U.S. imperialism because what we that war over there, which was 70 years ago, right, which was a U.N. action, but was really spearheaded by the United States, killed fucking I'm sorry. I Googled this today, and if you look up Korean death toll, it talks about the 60,000 Americans that died. All right? That's never good when American soldiers die. You know, they're working class, you know, Americans as well. Um, but that's the first thing you see on a Google search from CNN. You have to go way, way down in that search to see what the Korean casualties are. So in that war, 1 million South Koreans died. 1.5 North Koreans died, including 600,000 civilians. They were bombing, the United States was bombing uh, North Korea to the extent that more bombs were dropped in that short war in Korea than were dropped in the entire Pacific theater, you know, against Japan in the, in the Second World War. And they only stopped bombing because there were no more targets left. Most of the cities were bombed 90% destroyed. And Pyongyang, their capital, was bombed 75%, was completely annihilated. So 
You know, yeah. again, not making any apologies for North Korea, but like we might not have a memory of that, but these people have a memory of that. They want peace because they remember their fathers, their grandfathers, their grandmothers, you know, uh, dying uh, or being injured in this war. And uh, they want to be reunited with their families in many cases who they haven't seen because of this partition between these two countries. So fuck the United States. Fuck yeah. Rachel Maddow. Fuck Donald Trump. But if he falls dick first into the right thing to do, which is making a fucking peace treaty over there, no more war games, then fine. Fuck it. Who gives a yeah. shit? People act like Trump started the tensions with North Korea, right. which it was is Truman, a Democrat, a pretty ahistorical interpretation of any of this. So they're like, oh, well, he's just fixing a problem that he himself caused with his tweets. But like <laughs> it goes back a bit before that. That was why I think the, the war kicked off is that uh, that the Soviet Truman Union was, was tweeting some mean things <laughs> <Yeah>. about <laughs> Stalin. Yeah. yeah. I, w- I would be interested to see, you know, let's in, in, in the world in which Hillary Clinton is president, I wonder, I'd be interested to see, you know, if she were to broker some kind of peace or, or help. What would Rachel Maddow then have to say about this? About mm, this piece? I wonder. Interesting. You think partisan politics might play a big role? In- mm, maybe. I mean, you want to compare it to the uh, Iran deal that uh, everyone supported, all the liberals supported, of course, because it was Obama. And, you know, to his credit, I think he did a pretty good job with that, and I would have liked to see what he could have done with North Korea. But um, if Obama were, if if a Hillary or an Obama were doing these talks right now, I think the response would be a complete 180. And like Obama gave stuff up in the Iran nuclear deal that a lot of people didn't think he should have, but he needed to do it in order to get this deal to go through, and that was good. Look, at the end of the day, we've been the world hegemonic power for the 70 years that Rachel Maddow has been talking about. And um, we're starting to see that go away right now. I think that if you look at things historically, the U.S. empire, U.S. hegemony, uh, I just do not see with our debt and our structural problems. I do not see it continuing. And so the response of uh, the liberal class and then, of course, the reactionary response too, with this rah-rah, go-go, militaristic jingoism thing is very, very frightening because the United States will hopefully go peacefully into that good night like i don't know past emper- emp- empires like the dutch or the well, spanish or the dutch the... weren't sitting on a huge stockpile of nukes though. exactly that's the huge i mean issue. that <laughs> that is the thing that sam is worried about that he's brought up a number of times on the show he's worried that if america loses its soft power around the world all it's going to have left is hard power yep. and that will be what it resorts to as it rages against the dying of the light <sighs> so i guess we'll see so that pretty much wraps up the news. Uh, there was a short thing we're going to do on the fact that 69% of millennials nice. at nice. this point uh, support Medicare for all. Uh, and that presumes also uh, condoms for all since it's, you know, that's the percentage. Uh, but yeah, I don't think we really have time. So we're going to go straight into the meat, to the heart of this episode, which is discussing the completely uncontroversial and uh, not totally blasted throughout the mainstream media concept, idea, and practice of identity Identity politics. politics. Uh, We're going to wade into it. We're really going to do it. Justin, are you ready? I'm ready. Uh, you don't seem ready. Are you at eight point five still? Or I'm, I'm, it's it's still there. All it's right. just, you know. He's focused. He's like um, still waters run deep. You know, <laughs> it's like he's not mad on the outside. He is perfectly calm and focused, but on the inside, it's a tempest raging. He's like American Psycho of the left. <laughs> <laughs> All right, on that note, um, we're going to start this uh, identity politics conversation off uh, with a, I think, like the perfect distillation of uh, what the right wing critique of uh, identity politics is. Uh, and it comes from a Prager U, which is not actually a university, uh, Prager U video, which we should add is a conservative uh, think tank ish sort of thing that's funded by these billionaires, the Wilkes brothers who um, have apparently made their billions off of fracking and now uh, spend money helping people like the Lobster Man to create uh, awesome videos called Dangerous People Are Teaching Your Kids. Mm -hmm. Our society of oppression. To understand and oppose the postmodernists, the ideas by which they orient themselves must be clearly identified. First is their new unholy trinity of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Boo. Diversity is defined not by opinion, 
but by race, ethnicity, or sexual identity. Not the free exchange of equity ideas. is no longer the laudable goal of equality of opportunity, mm. but the insistence on equality of outcome. Mm. And inclusion is the use of identity-based quotas Boom. to attain this misconceived state of equity. Is that it? No, that's just the first section. Oh, We're going to get a little I mean, more. How can you have... Uh, I mean, you can't have equality of opportunity without a whole bunch of interventions that Jordan Peterson opposes. So he's already contradicting himself. But if you say everybody can, in theory, have this stuff, it's, it's your fault if you didn't get it. Yeah, I mean, Not anyone. All of the other things in your way. Anyone could, in theory, like buy a fucking mansion. Mm -hmm. Like there are no laws against it, but that doesn't mean that everyone is actually going to be able to. I mean, I could. In theory, if I had a million dollars, like buy this whole fucking building and become the landlord to Sam Cedar, but uh, <laughs> that's I don't think that's gonna happen anytime soon. Yeah, on that on that note, there's this great um, Anatole France quote, uh, which I always love. Uh, it's uh, in its majestic equality, the law forbids rich and poor alike to sleep under bridges, beg in the streets, and steal loaves of bread. So there's your uh, bourgeois equality for you. Yeah, and uh, gay people are totally allowed to get married if they're willing to marry a person of the opposite sex. Who said that? Somebody said that recently, right? Yeah. Ugh. <laughs> right, right wing is... That's a real argument that they have made. All right, let's go on. Let's see what else fucking lobster fuck has to say. Third and finally are the politics of identity. Postmodernists don't believe in individuals. You're an exemplar of your race, sex, or sexual preference. You're also either a victim or an oppressor. No wrong can be done by anyone in the former group, and no good by the latter. Such ideas of victimization do nothing but justify the use of power and engender intergroup conflict. All these concepts originated from Karl Marx, the 19th century <gasps> German philosopher. Marx viewed the world as a gigantic class struggle, yeah. the bourgeoisie against the proletariat, yeah, story the grasping out. rich against the desperate poor. Mm -hmm. yeah. But wherever his ideas were put into practice, in the Soviet <gasps> Union, China, Vietnam, and Cambodia. 400 few, billion people were killed. economies failed, and tens of millions were killed. We fought a decades-long... Capitalism's never killed anyone. Not one, one never. Notions. But they're back in they're the new guise of identity way. politics. Uh, no, it's not true. The corrupt <laughs> ideas of the postmodern neo-Marxists should be consigned <laughs> to the dustbin of history. If Instead, only, we underrate only everyone was Marxist. In the very institutions where the central ideas of the West should be transmitted across the generations. Unless we stop, postmodernism will do to America and the entire Western world what it's already done to its universities. Boom. I like that Trotsky quote, the dustbin of history. Hell yeah. I think that, that Jordan Peterson makes a great point. We should not be postmodern neo-Marxist. We should be pre-modern paleo-Marxists. Mm, that mm -hmm. is the way to go. If only, if only the kinds of liberal identitarians he's talking about were just smuggling Marxism into the universities and the internet I wish. Mm. So one thing that seems glaringly obvious, but I'll point it out anyway, is he seems to think that um, the first people who uh, sort of essentialized or divided up people based on their race or gender <laughs> were like social justice activists in the 1960s, which uh, kind of speaks to his historical blindness as to how these groups of people even came about as identity groups. I think the plantation owners in the south of the United States were the original SJWs because they were the first ones to group people into categories like that. I mean, the original identity politics was white identity politics, Absolutely. dare I say, because that is how they justified keeping human beings as slaves and making them work for free. Mm -hmm. And then I, I think whiteness, the idea of whiteness, you know, it can change and metamorphose as needed in order to kind of strengthen itself. And we see this throughout history with the, you know, various European immigrant populations being considered separate races from the white race. And then they come over here and so long as they advantage the ruling class, they can be considered white. Yeah, the Irish being the subhuman group, uh, Southern Europeans, uh, Hungarians, you know, there are all these scares about these immigrants, certainly Jews, you know, it took them a very long time to become white in this country. So yeah. it shows that it's not only a, a sort of mutable category, but it also is like the norm. So you become white when you become like a normal, uh, un, 
hyphenated member of society that doesn't have a, a, a race, essentially, right? To be white, it means to not have the burdens of race put upon you. It means to be the dominant group that whose dominance is kind of uh, uh, implicit, right? Yeah, um, it actually solved a lot of problems for the ruling class back in early colonial America and after the American Revolution as well. Um, Anti-miscegenation laws were made as a direct response to uh, blacks intermarrying with whites. And, uh, you know, who knows what could happen if the ruling class uh, is able to unite across lines of race. So, I mean, people talk... Uh, working class, you mean, not the ruling the, class. Yeah, oh, fuck. So the ruling class so has tired. done a great job of <laughs> cross racial lines recently. That is, that is also true. <laughs> they do a good job of solidifying this idea of whiteness um, to kind of control those that they need to control um, and to separate the people who actually have interests together, um, working class people, whether they be white or any any, any skin color. Um, so, well, I, you know, I guess the to talk a bit about you know race and identity politics you know and yeah like where do, where does racism come from where did slavery come from was it because europeans were just super racist so they're like oh we can we can enslave people because our ideology already accounts for that so let's do it was it that a crime of opportunity like that or was it am i getting that backwards no i mean i i would say i'm i'm I, I would say that r racism be begat uh, begat the idea of race in a way. I'd say that like racism is you need to create a way to to, to classify people um, and and organize them um, in order to further your own interests, your group's interests. Um, you know, for example, like black people in slavery in, 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 the, in, in the United States being, you know, a good way to start talking about that. We had, you know, white indentured servants. We, we had, you know, black people who, were, who had also been indentured servants, you know, in this country. Um, black people who, you know, would reach the end of their servitude and then can go and be freedmen and, you know, live a life. But, you know... Um, there came a point where the European immigrants coming over here um, weren't going to be in servitude, um, uh, and you need you need your workforce. And the best way to keep your workforce is to you know you know not let them not not give them the opportunity to walk away from the job. I keep uh, them in chains. Um, so how do you do that? You know how, how do you justify you know the bondage of a people, you know, you can justify the bondage of a people through the creation of ideas of race, the creation of ideas of, you know, well, these people are, you know, intellectually or morally inferior and therefore they need, they need to be, you know, in bondage. They need a paternalistic yeah. slave owners because they're like these children, you know, they need to be looked after and, uh, don't have the the same capacity for self governance, you know that, you know the mm -hmm. European folks have, right? Yeah, I really liked um, how Adolf Reed put it in the piece that we all read by him that I will probably link to in the blog because he has a really good handle on the history of this stuff, and he can even chart the shift in ideology where this started to happen. Whereas initially, people kind of regarded or sold slavery as a necessary evil, and then as soon as they began to get pushback on it, which was pretty much from the beginning, I think, because, uh, you know, a lot of people can intuitively sense that slavery is wrong. Uh, that's when they flipped it and started to say, oh, actually, slavery is good. It's good for it's a good relationship. It's good for the blacks. And they started to create this idea of what race even was that didn't really exist before with a little assist from Enlightenment era yes. race science, yep. mm. which uh, you know obviously has since been discredited as pseudoscience in 
in most circles. Yeah, you know, we still got the back. Charles Murray's trying <laughs> we to We still bring got the back. Murrays of the world, yeah. but it's been largely discredited. No, it's been scientifically discredited. Let's yeah. put it that yeah. way. Ideologically, yeah, there, there's still some, something there. Uh, people are trying to bring that back for you know ideological reasons. Obviously, they want to put um, all the marginalized and oppressed people back into their place. That is their big yeah. uh, move. So, like now, when people like Jordan Peterson are saying. Oh, all you social justice warriors are dividing people up on the basis of racial categories or gender categories. Like, those are categories created by the white ruling class in the first place. And only then did they become a site of struggle. Like, there would be no such thing as uh, the black community if it weren't for the creation of race in the first place. Right. For the purposes of labor domination right yeah. we, we inherited these categorizations we're not we didn't know you know nobody no social justice warrior invented them for the purpose of you know attacking western culture right you know shakespeare yeah. you know it, it was meant to to take down those dead white males i mean yeah it's to to like put another point on uh, a finer point on what jamie said too you know it does arise out of these enlightenment ideals and it arises again after the fact of we need a uh, exploited, dominated, and docile workforce uh, that, oh, it turns out we can have racialized, right? After this, this enlightenment thought arises and people come up with ex post facto justifications for it, it then uh, racism as a structure takes on a life of its own and does become this sort of um, autonomous category that uh, I don't think anybody that's listening to this show thinks that it hasn't had an absolutely tremendous effect on the history of this country in yeah. all sorts of different ways. Like what Marx would call a real abstraction, yes, right? Yes, exactly. Like it is a constructed idea that now operates as a force in the world. Exactly. And it would be ridiculous to ignore that. Um, also, I like this line, I guess I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but from the Combahee River Collective statement of 1977, because um, it sounds, huh, funnily enough, a lot like Jordan Peterson oh. when they say... As Horseshoe bl- theory. Or perhaps, I mean, obviously, Jordan Peterson is appropriating the language of social justice. The right always does. When that. they say, as black women, we find any type of biological determinism a particularly dangerous and reactionary basis upon which to build a politic. So, um, yeah, it seems like they don't disagree at all. What's going on there? The idea of biological difference um, being means to classify and categorize people. I mean, this is what, you know, Reed's talking about in, in his piece and, you know, to bring in another, uh, bring, bring in some other uh, writers, the the Field Sisters, uh, Barbara Karen Fields, their great book, Racecraft, talks about this. Um, the, you know, we we kind of valorize this this kind of fake idea of, like, biological difference being the, the foundation upon which we we divide people um that race you know you know to them and is kind of not actually a thing um there might be you know people might look different because you know they came from a certain part of the earth and had more exposure to the sun and therefore they evolved to have to have a different skin color or whatever and melanin I, and like, iq yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 but like the 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 idea that there is there is this scientific you know biological categorization of people the, this difference means this person is that thing is you know a made up idea and one that is made up because it advantages people with class interests so one important step in the history of what we now call identity politics was the Combahee River Collective Statement from April of 1977. And that was created by a group of black lesbian Marxists who were sort of confronting this white, straight, bourgeois feminism that they felt pretty alienated from, even on what might be nebulously defined as the left. And it's not hard to believe that the uh, white feminist movement of the 70s was not, in, or I mean, I, I, wish, I should say the mainstream feminist movement of the 70s was uh, largely white and not as inclusive as it could have been. Um, they specifically name the lesbian separatist movement, which was definitely a thing in the 70s, as um, being insufficient, um, insufficiently dealing with the issues of, of race and class. Um, because when you say all women are automatically united and have something in common, 
And that's the most important pole around which we must orient ourselves to throw off the yoke of male oppression. That's pretending that all women's interests are the same. And as we know, they're not the same. Um, women are stratified based on class, right? Like a, a woman who owns, who's the CEO of a corporation is going to have interests that are diametrically opposed to the women workers whose labor she's exploiting. And also in a society that is stratified by race, that's going to be a huge, huge influence on the experience of oppression that a lot of these women are dealing with. So they drafted, they made this statement that was very influential. That's where the term identity politics comes from. And it was basically designed to acknowledge um, all of the different forces that could be oppressing any given person at once. So I want to just pull a bit of, pull a quote out where they talk, they talk about this in a nutshell, but then they you know, expound on it. The most general statement of our politics at the present time would be that we are actively committed to struggling against racial, sexual, heterosexual, and class oppression and see as our particular task the development of integrated analysis and practice based upon the fact that the major systems of oppression are interlocking. The synthesis of these oppressions creates the conditions of our lives. So I think, you know, what they're bringing to it is, you know, these are all the specific ways in which we are oppressed, um, and they create a, an oppression that, that, is, that is unique but also fits within a universal. Um, so I think, you know, and I think bringing it back because they are, they do, they, they are Marxists, I think um, they, 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 this is central to what they see as liberation from, from a Marxist perspective. Um, further on in the text they say we're socialists because we believe that work must be organized for the collective benefit of those who do the work and create the products and not for the profit of the bosses oh, yeah. obviously um, material resources must be equally distributed among those who create these resources and then they go on to say we are not convinced however that a socialist revolution that is not also a feminist and anti-racist revolution will guarantee our liberation what I think is incredible about that is that was written 40 years ago, you know, in the creation of this conception of identity politics in this statement. But that statement, you know, we're not convinced that a socialist revolution that's not also a feminist and anti-racist revolution will guarantee our liberation. I think it's so fundamental now to what every anti-capitalist believes in the United States and, and elsewhere. What every anti-capitalist should believe. Well, unfortunately, yeah, you, you, you bring up a good point is that um, – a lot has happened since that point, you know, 41 years ago or so. And uh, what I think these uh, these women were trying to confront, too, not just from the, you know, white, straight, bourgeois feminists, but I think from large sections of the left, too, was a very vulgar class uh, reductionism that was telling people, you know, no matter what their orientation, gender, class, I'm sorry, uh, race was, that, you know, we'll figure these things out, you know, when the revolution comes. You know, we'll deal with race, racial oppression, we'll deal with, uh, you know, gay rights, you know, at some later date. And folks, did, the people just didn't, they couldn't wait, they didn't want to wait. And they made sure to put a marker down that said that this has to happen in the course of our organizing. That class reductionism, you know, essentially um, is insufficient, not just because it doesn't do, thing, do enough for us, but because it doesn't do enough for the socialist cause in general. Unfortunately, yeah. you're starting to see, I think, a lot of this vulgar workerism and this class reductionism coming creep, back. It's creeping back. As a reaction, I think, to how... To um, neoliberal identity politics. Oh, so let's, so let's talk yeah. about that. Let's talk oh. about how this particular Marxist statement on identity politics over the years turned into something different, turned into something that's not uh, radically liber liberatory and... Uh, uh, neoliberal, as you say. Well, I, I just want to emphasize one last time that they did have a collective universalizing goal, right? Because people accuse anybody trying to inject identity politics into socialism of um, injecting, of being a race reductionist, right? Of injecting neoliberal ideology. Um, but from their perspective, that is how you gain collective liberation. Like they say here, if black women were free, it would mean that everyone else would have to be free since our freedom would necessitate the destruction of all the systems of oppression. Boom. That's you know, it. Race, mm -hmm. class, gender, sexuality. Which is a mirror of the, of the fundamental uh, supposition of the anti-capitalist movement, which is that 
the working class in its whole is that universal class that can abolish all exploitation and domination because it's in our interest. Right. right. So when you, you know, I mean, this an example, and we can maybe talk about this later or not, but an example that I see currently with some folks on the left is like, you know, let's not talk about prison abolition, you know, because you might, you might, people will say, well, what do you do with the serial killers? You know, if there are no prisons, you know, um, uh, or people use arguments like, you know, if they're, you know, you know, what about these, these communities that are over-policed? Maybe they actually want the police there, you know, like the, but prison abolition is, is, is a horizon that, that we would work toward as anti-capitalists, as people that are fighting for liberation of all people. Um, yeah. And it's, it's not a distraction. And it saying. is, yeah. it's, it's it is a universal project, certainly, mm-hmm. that also happens to disproportionately affect people of color, which like a lot of the universal projects that Adolf Reed is talking about do disproportionately affect people of color in and America. a lot of poor white people and, too. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so like it's kind of a false dichotomy when a disingenuous liberal is like, well, you know, we could have free college education, we could have Medicare for all, we could break up the big banks, but is that gonna end racism? <laughs> like that's actually a, a thing that Hillary Clinton said and like, no. Of course not, but it would certainly help a lot of fucking people, including people of color, including women, because we are, women and people of color, are disproportionately re- represented in the working class, so that would be a really good knockoff effect. It, the, the working class, by definition, is the majority of society, so if you were to just take it at its like most minimal, so people who work for a wage who aren't in a supervisory position, that's somewhere between 65 and 70% of the U.S. population. So whether you're white, black, brown, you know, whatever, or whether you're gay, straight, you know, or other... It, chances are that you are a working class person in this country. So something that in a universal way helps the working class will disproportionately help all working class yeah. people, regardless of their position. I, I mean, I think the, the, the problem we have now, and this is the, the, the left in many ways, it's kind of like the left leftists hear, you know, the term identity politics or they hear the term intersectionality. I don't really want to get into intersectionality because that's like that's a whole a other big controversy, whole other yeah. conversation yeah. To, be, to be had there um, with like very specific origins of, the, of that phrase that then have been kind of changed into something new that maybe doesn't have too much to do with the origin. Um, but identity politics as the kind of someone's because someone has a certain identity, their politics is like entirely wedded to that and that is like their 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 practice is entirely wedded to um issues of identity um and i think leftists quibble at that because it kind of in many ways and you've seen many examples of this you know since comedy river collective and um where you know you know for example black you know getting you know a black mayor or a black congressperson or a black you know senator or president somehow you know is an end in itself um whereas those people you know the black elite political class you know has its own class interests they're not the same class interests as the working class many of whom happen to be black so what someone who, who who's who's primary you know political practice is one of identity politics might say, you know, well, we got, we got to win. We got a bomb in the white house, you know, but like we have more black CEOs. Yeah. More black CEOs, more, black more CEOs. women prison guards. <laughs> <Yes. Yeah. laughs> uh, but, but what did, what did that, what did, what did that get, what did that get you, you know, in, in your, in, you know, the, the material reality of your life, what did that, what did that do for you? I mean, not a whole lot. We, we, we saw, we saw the mobility of black people, crater and you know obama's administration not just black people lots of people so yeah the financial crisis was also i believe the single biggest hit dealt to black wealth in this country since black people started being allowed to own property i believe yeah i think that's correct and that was a real front on which obama failed and not just obama like the entire system, the, the ruling class, right? Uh, yeah. And and the you know the class whose interests Obama was elected to represent as the president of a bourgeois democracy, right? 
But I think also, like, we were talking the other night about how there's, like, a good kind and a bad kind of identity politics. And I think a lot of people on the left uh, are currently experiencing, they're having a backlash reaction to the cynical and disingenuous way that uh, liberals, liberal politicians in particular, have used identity as a cudgel against any, even the mildest of challenges from the left, right? Like, obviously, the biggest example looming in my mind is 2016, when Hillary Clinton uh, presented her gender identity as a woman as being somehow inherently progressive or quote-unquote anti-establishment and everyone was railing on Bernie for being a white guy when at the same uh, time... Jews only became white 60 years ago, but yeah. That is true. So for being a white guy for, you know, the past 60 years of his <laughs> life or so. Uh, and then obviously we saw how utterly disingenuous this was. I mean, I mean, I, we, most of us knew from the beginning, but like they just showed their asses over and over again, like... You know, Bernie, oh, he's a white Jewish guy, fuck him. But then, like, Keith Ellison wants to be the chair of the DNC, and all of a sudden, like, he's an anti-Semite, and they were doing all these, like, horrific Islamophobic lines of attack on him that didn't actually work that well, in my opinion, just because of, I mean, most people aren't stupid, and they know that a black Muslim is not more privileged than... um, who is he up against? Uh, not more Tom privileged. Perez. Not more privileged than a white Jewish guy, right? Because that's the dichotomy they were setting up, or that I'm setting up here. And then another example that I actually wrote an op-ed about recently was how uh, Hillary Clinton, who's all about supporting women, and you know, like Gloria Steinem or was it Madeleine Albright said, "There's a special place in hell yeah. for women who don't support other women." And not only is she a woman, but she's a progressive. She just endorsed Andrew Cuomo over Cynthia Nixon, who is not only a progressive woman, but also a member of the LGBT community. Mm-hmm. So, although, or, or Kirsten Gillibrand, who you know, endorsed you know, Joseph Crowley in New York 14 over Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Yeah, you know. it's, it's fucking bullshit. I think Gillibrand also endorsed Cuomo yeah. over Nixon. Yeah. So that just goes Special to show... Special place in hell for, uh, for them, huh? Yeah. They're, if, if I'm going to hell, they're going there right beside me. <laughs> <laughs> different, different circles of hell for different uh, self-hating uh, women. I, I want to make an analogy here because we talked about how um, the construction of the idea of race uh, comes out of the structural necessities uh, of exploitative uh, plantation um, production in the, in the South, right? Uh, A similar thing happens, I think, with this uh, conception of identity politics, which, as we mentioned, comes out of a Marxist perspective of these uh, black lesbian women who are pushing against, you know, the mainstream of the left, but staying well within the left. I think in a similar way, neoliberalism, which is thrown around a lot, but uh, neoliberalism is not just the retreat of working class politics and working class uh, self-organization and imagination, but also a full frontal attack by the class that's very well organized right now, which is the capitalist class, the bourgeois class, against all of the ways in which there were checks created to their uh, power within the workplace or politics or whatever. I don't think it's a surprise then that this term identity politics in that era could shift its meaning, could be operationalized instrumentalized in order to become something that essentially now means diversity capitalism, right? Or diversity, diversity democracy. Okay. Right. Like, uh, also Reed says too, you know, it follows from the neoliberal identity politics perspective that if African Americans represent 14% of the U S population, I think that's what it is. Uh, then as long as 14% of the CEOs were black, then we have equality in this country. Now that is the, not insane (laughs) that is this structural way in which identity politics has been taken from its root and now turned into something that is a huge controversy and debate on the left because we're talking about different things right where there there is the original river collective argument about it right which is infusing our socialist movement with all these different ways in which people experience oppression and need to fight against it but 
you know, there's that. And on the other hand, there's also this Hillary Clinton special place in hell for women who don't support other women, you know, women CEO, CEOs, ideology. And those two things get confused a lot, right? So I think yeah. we should tease that out and, and, and try to look at some real yeah. world and examples if, of, of how that's, that's operating right now in our debates on the left. Yeah, yeah. And it's used um, to beat back critics as well. Like if, um, I mean, I've def- certainly had this happen on the internet and I don't feel like a victim, but like there have been times when I've criticized a black bourgeois politician when I've been called a racist. And there have been other times when uh, I stepped up and criticized a woman bourgeois politician because I knew no one could accuse me of being a sexist. Although I have certainly been accused of internalized sexism for my criticisms of Hillary Clinton, which I think is pretty fucking funny. Well, that's why you're in therapy, right? Mm, to try to mm-hmm. deal with your uh, self-hatred. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> Another interesting way I've seen this kind of weaponized against folks is, you know, you know, leftists of color. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about Twitter arguments, but I'll talk about Twitter argument. Fine. Like <laughs> leftists of color um, speaking, you know, you know, in support of somebody like Bernie Sanders or... Uh, Speaking in opposition to someone, you know, like Kamala Harris, who, you know, is, is a, a cop, is a cop, <laughs> is a fucking cop, is a cop, <laughs> literally locks up lots of people of all skin colors, mm-hmm. you know, like that's what she's done. Um, but and then they'll say, well, you well, how are you know, you're just you're just some Bernie bro. You're just some white leftist bro. And it's like, I mean, look at my avatar. You know, do you see do you see that you see the, the color of my skin? Bernie made me white. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's interesting the ways that they do that. Um, but they're, but uh, it's such a powerful critique, though, that they're like with the self-hating woman thing, or I suppose you're what a self-hating black man because you support progressive socialist politics. Oh, it's for a, a woman of color, Hillary Clinton. <laughs> right. <laughs> it, but but it's very effective though on in in places like Twitter, and uh, I think even in the real world too, right? Like the DSA uh, has had controversies over this. The organization you guys uh, are both delegates in, right? Yeah, well, so. I guess to fast forward to the present moment mm-hmm. a bit, um, we have been having a lot of conversations on the left about how to be more inclusive and how to account for race and gender in our movement in a way that does not inject neoliberal ideology into our movement. And a lot of people have a lot of opinions you know, some critiques are made in better faith than others, I think. But, um, you know, fast forward to now. We all live in society. We all live in white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy, like it or not. And the status quo is that. So if we don't do anything, if we just ignore these issues, our organization is probably going to be led primarily by straight white men. Who and have the most power within the system that already exists yeah and i think we can all agree i mean certainly all of us in this room can agree there are some people who probably think it's not that important but i think we can all agree that that's bad and that that needs to change and that there are issues with it um as the only uh non-jewish uh cishet white male um union construction guy in this room i'm not sure i agree but convince me change my mind (laughs) change my mind all right well um yeah, we okay. I'm going to change your mind. Change my mind. Well, you know, the working class, as we said, is not just uh, cishet white men. It is. It is on my job. It's. <laughs> it's the major. It's the vast majority of people of color. The vast majority of women. The vast majority of LGBT people. Because it's the vast majority of everyone here and abroad. So. If we want to unite the working class and win, you know, we need to bring everyone along. Hold on, hold but on, there, hold on. No, go ahead. I go mean, ahead. There, there were, this is all true. Um, but there are folks who would make the argument that, you know, because they're all the working class, it is in our interest to make demands that can capture the broadest, uh, you know, amount of the working class um, and not specific ones so like the emphasis upon universal uh universal demands you know particularly within dsa i'm thinking about but you know you know so like and and i want to make sure i'm clear like i'm not opposed to any of these things but i think if you want to make the argument that universal demands will you know disproportionately benefit you know people of color um 
women, uh, queer, trans folks, whatever, um, and use that as kind of like your 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 blanket way of dealing with, you know, of addressing entire entire groups of people, um, and kind of shrugging your shoulders at any kind of questions about you know about particularities of oppression. Um, I think that is problematic in our in our movement, and I, th- and I see a lot more of that nowadays. Yeah. Yeah, because if you end up in a situation like uh, with the DSA or other socialist group where you have a um, you know largely white male leadership telling that to you know, folks on the street who you're helping to, you know, organize and organizing with, uh, it can come off as very condescending, right? And as as not recognizing the particular experience that they've had with class oppression, just saying like, oh, you know, it's universal, you know, you don't have to worry about it, you know, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Well, um, so that brings me to this thing I want to talk about. Um, what thing is that? Which is the uh, resolution to create an Afro-socialist and Socialist of Color caucus. And that was sort of a really sincere attempt to deal with some of these issues within our organization. And, you know, I would like to extrapolate and apply some of these lessons to the left as a whole, because, um, you know, not everyone listening to this podcast is a member of DSA necessarily. Or... If you do your work, they all will be soon. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah. So um, do you want to explain a little bit about what was in this resolution and what it was trying to do? Sure. So, um, so I'm, I'm a, you know, in addition to being North Brooklyn organizing committee, um, I'm a member of the Afro Socialist and Socialist of Color Caucus. Um, that caucus, the resolution um, for the convention last August, you know, was for the national organization to recognize this caucus um, uh, and to adopt um, the Black Youth 100, uh, Black Youth Project 100's, uh, you know, agenda for for Black futures. Um, you know, which includes, you know, reparations, uh, talks about mass incarceration, et cetera. Um, but I yeah, think- can you explain a little bit how, um, they got assist- involved with the Black Youth 100 project? Um, so I, I, I can't tell you specifics too much because like I wasn't part of the, the founding group of, of, of Afrosoch, as we, as we, as we call it. Um, but having, Members from the founding group who are all here in New York City, too, um, you know, we're trying to establish relationships with um, if, with Black Youth Project 100 um, and other kind of majority people of color organizations that 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 we see to be we see to be aligned with us um, and really, really love what they had in that in, in their agenda for for black futures. And, and we're like, we're, we're on board with this. I think we should support this. So would you call that a kind of coalition building? Yes, I would. Because I know there's like a bit of debate going on about whether or not we should be like farming out some of our policy procedures to other groups and the difference between that and forming coalitions on certain projects. Right. And I mean, and mind you, that was that was a year ago. And and like, you know, where where we are with 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 working with other organizations, you know, we're we're we're. We're we're in a different place, and we're making progress on on, on building relationships with other with other organizations, other people doing doing work in in, in this area. But um, it's you know, of course, you want to make relationships with other with other groups. Um, I mean, if if there's a if there's a critique about farming out, I mean, I I mean, and, and to some degree, I can kind of understand that criticism. But um, I think at the time, this was written. This resolution was written by you know five members, you know, five black members of, of, of DSA. I think mostly New York City, also someone from the North New Jersey uh, uh, branch. But, uh, you know, we wanted to, DSA as, as constituted at the time, you know, doesn't really have, I don't necessarily think had the kind of credibility to kind of maybe say, this is what we think is, is what, what, what we want for black people, for people of color. Now that might change, I think, if, and if the, the goal ultimately, and I think, you know, if we're to have a kind of platform or a kind of, you know, you know that we're going to put forward, um, it would make sense for, for us, um, having grown by leaps and bounds in terms of our, you know, black and, and POC representation, we can 
we can work on that together. But I don't think we were in the place to do that a year ago, and we're probably not yet either. So, so you're saying basically the issue was that you, as a very minoritarian uh, caucus within the group, you weren't within the uh, D, uh, the DSA. You weren't even in a position to be able to uh, create your own platform, um, co- not coherently, but like uh, effectively, so that you convincingly, convincingly, yeah, that's the right thing. So, so you, so you basically took what was already a grassroots uh, program on the ground and brought that into the DSA as a way of basically keeping your your ear to the ground. Is, is that a fair assessment? Yeah, that's fair. I think, um, and also the, one of the the efforts. I mean, one of the, one of the aims of this resolution is also to like establish those ties. So, like you know, like I said, it, it was an effort that came from New York City's, you know, from from Black folks within New York City DSA, um, going into a national convention when the organization had just grown tremendously, um, and this was an opportunity for us to 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 establish this thing and connect with all the other people of color, all the other black people in chapters from all over the country um, who are also dealing with the same issues of like, you know, underrepresentation and all that, all that, all that that entails and all the stuff that happens because of that, you know, in the day to day of running a chapter. Um, So since then, now we've established these relationships with other members in other chapters. Um, And one of the, like the current project, one of the current projects we're working on is, is helping chapters around the country establish their own local caucuses um so you know we have we have one that's pretty strong in new york city you know like the last time that we had a we we've, we have a semi-regular happy hours the last one we had was like the biggest one i'd seen um and we do political education we're, we're doing kind of like online and in-person in political education so like for, for example we're going to do a black jacobins reading group oh cool uh, at the I beginning, met, I beginning of july last episode and, CLR yeah. james friend of the show are those reading groups open to everyone or are some of them only for black socialists and socialists of color it's open all right oh, yeah so you're not creating a neoliberal um identity politics beachhead in order to destroy the socialist unity of your group <laughs> No, we're not. It's a bit a bit oh, of a because, loaded question. Yeah. Some some people might well, be arguing that. Yeah. Well, yeah. So to to sort of sum up the aims of this uh, resolution, which did pass in the end, um, overwhelmingly. Yeah. Um, the it was to sort of avoid reproducing institutional racism within a left organization, right? I mean, mm, or or broad and broaden our base to more of the working class. Well, I would say. That would be kind of like a, a, I guess maybe a side effect of it. So first, it's to recognize the caucus, and the caucus is for for, for black people and people of color within the organization to, um, to be able to network, to be able to build power within the organization. Um, but also in recognizing this caucus, this being a commitment on the part of the organization to work on to work on issues that 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 advance the liberation of you know of black people and people of color. Um, so that also includes like political education efforts, teaching the black radical tradition. Um, there are, there are politi- there's a lot of good political education, but I think there's, there may be a kind of tendency to emphasize, you know, the, the quote unquote canon of, of dead white men. And there's a lot, there's a lot more than that. Um, and also endorsement of the UIP 100's agenda to build back fu- black futures. I think that's really important because uh, the image that socialism has right now in the world is very white and very male and that's just not reality like so much so much of what we achieved as left movements have been has been as the result of the work of women and people of color and there's such a rich radical tradition among black leftists in particular um but you know also racialized people around the world you know anti-colonial struggles Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Um, and people really don't realize that. Like, and there's a, a lot of mistrust, I think, in some communities of color towards socialist ideas and towards the left. I mean, I don't. I think there were a lot of factors that went in to the uh, the breakdown of the voting results in the 2016 primary. But the fact is, not enough people of color voted for Bernie Sanders. M- many more voted for Hillary Clinton. And I think part of it is like a, a rightful pessimism about what we can get at this point in time as working people. 
Um, part of it is the image of socialism as this like dusty white male thing. And there, there are a lot of parts to it. But certainly the idea of educating people about the rich history of black radicalism in the United States is so important and not something that I think many people would disagree with on the left. And wouldn't, and wouldn't a, a large part of that uh, distrust or, I don't know, hesitancy to, to sign on to something like this, is it, it would seem to me that that would be part of the historical generational memory of a lot of uh, black people in the United States, given that you know in the 60s and 70s you had this radical leftist upsurge of black groups all over this country that were in large part destroyed by the government, you know, through repression uh, and in many and cases... And violence. And, and violence and, and also self-destructed because of their, their own internal contradictions. So the people, you know, when you come to them and you start talking about socialism and things of this sort, maybe their parents or their grandparents have been part of the BLA. You know, they've been part of the Black Panthers or at least, you know, adjacent to them and saw what happened the last time. Yeah, they saw what happens to people. Right. Which, like, fair enough, the penalties for being a radical are always going to be greater for people of color in this country. I also think, like, part of what happened with, particularly with this 2016 primary is, you know, Hillary Clinton being 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 the wife of Bill Clinton. Um, first black president. The quote-unquote first <laughs> black president. Um, but, I mean, there's... It's, no, he wasn't, obviously. But, <laughs> but like... Um, there's a lot there is there is a thing there is there is black people whether this is earned or not kind of have a i think to a certain extent a relationship with bill clinton and therefore hillary even though hillary did a lot of stuff to 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 damage that and probably that played a part in the the, the way that black people did not show up for her at the polls because it's like what why why for her but like you know there is an attachment there is a kind of there's there's history there, and I think when you talk about black people in their relation to, to the Democratic Party, this is why you know Bernie, I mean, and I feel like Bernie could have probably, even though the Southern states, the Southern primaries, you know, which he lost very badly, he lost very badly because the black, the, the Democratic Party in the South is basically the black Democratic Party in the South, um, and if you can't win that, you're not gonna win. You're not gonna win the primary. No. You touched on this before when you were talking about um, black mayors and black congresspeople and black senators and black presidents. Uh, Black Agenda Report, I forget what the name of the guy who does that, but certainly Adolf Reed, too, talks about this and others, this conception of the uh, black misleadership class Mm. um, that essentially uh, manages the expectations of black folks. And um, is it fair to say that uh, they have a, a... a preponderance of influence when it comes to actually bringing out the votes and, and who's to vote for, whether that's a, uh, you know, a politician down in Mississippi or whether that's a preacher or whatever the case may be. There's this, again, like you were saying, this false sort of cross-class unity that's presupposed within, you know, black people in America that reflects itself in the, in the politics. Right. I mean, the Democratic Party, I think what you, what, you, what we just said, I agree with 100 percent. Like it's it's basically seen as kind of like you're 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 a black person in the United States. I guess you're going to vote Democrat because like what else what else are you going to do? You're going to vote for these reactionary racist Republicans who no. are reactionary and racist. <laughs> uh, you know, no, you're not going to do that. But it's not like the your other option is is really all that good. I mean, granted, you know, and I I, I think you know in the um, the podcast that y'all been talking about, we've been talking about you know, Adolf Reed talks about you know like a John Lewis. Um, and John Lewis, you know, Snick John Lewis is a, is a hero. J- John Lewis now, I mean, you know. Snitch John Lewis. No, oh, come on. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Man. I just, no, but I just like, lost a big audience. This is, the, I, mean, I, I mean, I think there's a difference between that John Lewis and, 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 and present day John Lewis. Not to disparage, you know, him in any way. I, I'm, I'm, like, extremely proud that, like, a man like that, you know, is here today and in Congress, but also... Are, are his interests um, the same interests of of poor working class people? Um, I don't know. Um, it, it points to I think a structural thing, right? Which is that people who the John Lewis of SNCC, who obviously felt very comfortable going down and um, not from above but from within, uh, speaking with uh, poor rural 
um, black Americans in the South about voting rights or organizing with working class uh, black Americans in the North. Um, once he gets into power and once he's in these structures of um, you know domination, which is the bourgeois state, it necessarily changes not just your structural position, but also eventually too the way in which you encounter the world, right? The ideology that you take on. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, what thirty years he's been? He's a long-standing uh, congressperson, right? Been there a long time. Yeah, it takes uh, thirty years will do a lot to somebody's brain, you know, when it comes to uh, well, what, and the circles you have to move in right. as a bourgeois politician. Like Obama said it in his autobiography like he spent most of his time when he was a senator raising money at parties state, with rich people state senator. Mm -hmm. when he was a and senator wait. right state senator and senator. oh yeah. yeah uh and it does it obviously is going to put you out of touch with the interests of the working class because you're just not around them as much like he freely admitted to that so that's definitely a structural thing that we need to watch out for. It's not that people are necessarily uh, losing their way, losing their morals. They're like, just, right. they turn out to be bad people. That's just like what happens when you are working within the system. So, and it's the same thing with a union bureaucrat, right? You know, you have these rank and file insurgents that rise up within unions. And there's actually, there was somebody who was high up in the leadership of a union I may or may not uh, be a part of, who was a Maoist. But over the years, she got beaten down by the day in, day out, you know, mediation of capital and labor to become just another uh, standard bureaucrat with maybe a little better um, rhetoric. But again, when you're in those halls of power, whether that's the union or whether that's the, you know, the bourgeois state, right, it necessarily changes the way that you interact with the world and your views on the world and how you um, accumulate and use power. Yeah, I think there's also the idea that is, you know, set forth in good faith by a number of people, I think, and, you know, in bad faith by probably more, that, like, the best that marginalized communities can hope for is a seat at the table within the power structure that currently exists. And then the left comes along and says, we want to burn the fucking table. <laughs> and that's, like, kind of a tough sell for some people. We had a... Uh, so I'm in... The, the, our socialist feminist working group in, in, in NYC DSA is having... A, we're doing a black, uh, a radical black feminism uh, reading group that's going to go on through August. It's like all summer long, every Monday. Y'all should come. Hell yeah! Um, but last week we did the first one, and we talked about uh, we talked about the Combahee River Collective Statement. We also talked about uh, Audre Lorde's uh, "The Master's Tools Will Never Dismantle the Master's House," um, and we could dive deep on that. And probably we don't have time for that. But one of the things that we talked about in relation to that was example of larry krasner the, the the da in philly oh yeah um and like what he's doing you know when he's done a lot of great stuff since he's since he's since he's come into office um can he you know actually do rev rev revolutionary work within that office like he is a cop now yes you know <laughs>